Okay. So uh, I think uh, fever, when a patient, uh, any child comes with fever and altered sensorium, it becomes a medical emergency for us, right? So we will be focusing on how to approach this child. So we suppose we have a three-year-old who comes with fever for three days, altered sensorium since the morning. And we are on examination, you find that the child is uh, having altered DCS and ne some meningeal signs. Then obviously the first uh, diagnosis all of us I think would make is a bacterial meningitis. So we'll start with uh, Dr. Harch. Uh, in a situation like this, when a patient comes with fever and altered sensorium, there are many terminologies which are used like meningitis, encephalitis and encephalopathy. Would you like to define these terminologies for the audience? Yes, sir. Hello. So familiarity with this uh, terminology is very important. So if we concept you, the encephalopathy is a very broad term. It involves everything. So any child or any patients present with any alteration of behavior, consciousness or sense of awareness, which is encephalopathy. Encephalopathy has a many causes from ranges from infectious, non-infectious, toxic, metabolic, everything. When we terms uh, encephalitis, then we are very specific. We are uh, incorporating the infection or inflammation as a cause of encephalopathy. And meningitis is a more specific term when we are thinking in terms of there is an inflammation of meninges or meningeal layer which results into the whatever the presentation of this child having the fever and alter sensorium. So, any of the other panelists would like to add anything for, uh, for the definitions? You are okay? In term, in, uh, what is the encephalopathy is Hello. what we Hello. clinically see actually. Encephalitis, when we have evidence of all, taking into consideration of investigation, all these things, we can call it as encephalitis. So, uh, as you can see, these kind of cases require a little bit of uh, clinical, good clinical history and examination to actually define what is meningitis, encephalitis, and importantly, encephalopathy. So we'll come to the next question for uh, Nikhil. How would you differentiate between an acute or a subacute febrile encephalopathy? Now, uh, this acute febrile encephalopathy. Uh, uh, good morning, everyone. Uh, so, acute febrile encephalopathy. Initially, the term was coined by the government for uh, Japanese encephalitis. It was initially said. So, when we are defining acute uh, febrile encephalopathy, it is usually a very short duration and the duration has been defined as 14 days. So, any any encephalopathy with fever, with altered sensorium or any CNS infection, uh, CNS which presents in less than 14 days, we term is at an acute. A subacute febrile encephalopathy is, uh, you know, we see it very less in pediatrics. It is more common in adults, but some cases like SSPE or metabolic encephalopathy or uh, 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 any uh, metabolic or immuno, uh, immunodeficiencies, they may present with subacute. So usually the differentiation is only with the time and acute would be less than two weeks and the subacute would be uh, more of uh, in the duration, it may be in weeks. So, it's the so, is it important for the etiological diagnosis? Yes. Uh, etiologically, the acute ones are more like a viral, uh, bacterial or which are very uh, rapidly progressing one. A subacute one may uh, are usually uh, related to organ failures or may be related to very chronic infections like TBM or uh, this thing. So, etiologically also it is very important to differentiate both of them. Yeah. So, I think in our setting we will think of we should always have TBM in the background if we have a subacute but of course it is known that even TBM can present with acute presentations. So we will go to the next question for Dr. Siva Prakash. What is the most common etiology you see in tropical countries? Like for instance in India. Hello. Hello. Good morning to all. Uh, if you know acute encephalopathy, what are the causes, what organism causes? 
it depends on the geographical area of the world even in india it's maybe a because of maybe we can divide into different pattern like probably because of the infective cause or non infective cause like that if you come to the infective cause which is more commonly we come across in our uh, practice it's mainly again it is divided into maybe a viral maybe a bacterial parasitic and etc if you come to the viral is the most of the time virus is the cause common virus you come across again the government of india again it divide into g encephalopathy non g encephalopathy also so non g g is one of the important especially in some particular areas if the patient is coming from there we have to suspect that non g again whatever we come across virus it may come with the encephalopathy maybe a dengue maybe a <clears throat> malaria maybe sometimes a rickets cell fever so many organisms even the viral we have seen even h1n1 influenza adenovirus we have seen encephalopathy even the corona also contributed encephalopathy so most of the time organisms or viral any virus commonly whatever the prevalent in that particular geographic area we have to suspect and also that season what virus is there in that particular thinking we have to suspect anyway it is a non virus etiology so many are there will be starting from a toxicology like a drugs like a poison maybe a bite so many things are there so what so, about if suppose you have to give like for this audience that common we know infections are common still in india so what is the common bacteria and common virus you've already touched on yeah so bacteria we know that uh, uh, pyogenic bacteria tubercular uh, encephalitis is very common again the uh, if you come to the bacteria pneumococcus and uh, even uh, uh, hip nowadays the hip is reducing because of the vaccination even over the period may pneumococcus may come down but as of now pneumococcus should be suspected and also tubercular meningitis as a capital city of tb we have to suspect a tb also one of the cause so basically and also enteroviruses very commonly we come across we forget common virus is the enteroviruses will not get the diagnosis many a time so i think the message from this question is that if you are in suppose northeast india and in my state probably i would think of je first and then you even have non je causes but bacteria is still there in spite of the universal coverage of the vaccines we you know all over the country we are giving now pneumococcal vaccine also but still we do see cases on and off so uh, dr vasanth uh, what are the common clinical features which these patients usually will present with Uh, for the post graduates if you can highlight yeah uh, usually clinical feature depends on whether it's a meningitis or whether it's encephalitis totally different suppose it's a meningitis in neonate you get patient with unconsolable cry fever seizure uh, that irritability you may get hypothermia or you may get hyperthermia but if child is more than 28 days then you get uh, typical all these signs along with seizure but you get a uh, omitting uh, headache photophobia this is the tip, classical difference you may get neck stiffness uh, in uh, child more than um, 28 days but you usually don't get uh, neck stiffness in uh, uh, neonate and if you take the example of uh, uh, you want to consider encephalitis then encephalitis it's go step by step usually child present with a high grade fever uh, delirium irrelative to talk and that get progress uh, slowly uh, there is a, again there is a repetition of seizure and patient may go to uh, coma any of the other panelists would like to add or supplement his nikhil so the clinical features uh, vary from age uh, it may vary from etiology whenever you are looking at uh, infective causes they usually start with fever and uh, altered sensorium it may va- vary from just a amnesia to mild syncopal attacks to altered sensorium to coma but when we are looking at a non infective causes they may present initially with all the different uh, presentations like vomiting mild headache they may not present with fever even the age group differs so if in the neonate as sir has said they may present and as we progress they may have a different so seizures is one of the thing which is a very critical thing 
so presenting with seizures is uh, is usually we get in our emergencies are those with presenting with more with seizures so i think this is a very important message that if you have fever with seizures then you must think of a cns infection thank you very much so do all uh, children present with meningeal signs so i think we all know that hello so as we all know that all the children are not presenting always with the uh, meningitis have all meningeal signs and the infants and the neonates the only alter sensorium or alter behavior with along with fever we should think in terms of pain and infection especially in the younger infants and even those who are vaccinated till the age of uh, one and a half to two years of age they may not have uh, all the signs of meningeal infections they very subtle they present with uh, this kind of uh, uh, symptoms even the viral fever at right? aseptic meningitis they more, most of the patient doesn't have a proper meningeal sign so whenever you have a fever with alter behavior alter sensorium in the presence of uh, seizures or any focal deficit definitely you have to think in terms of cns infection and you have to uh, try to investigate the child accordingly so i think sometimes when you have children with malnutrition they also may not have meningeal signs so in the clinical context of a malnourished child you must always suspect uh, meningitis or rule it out so so uh, what are the causes of febrile encephalopathy with meningeal signs uh, febrile encephalopathy uh, meningeal signs so what what is what meningeal signs are usually there when there is an inflammation of meningitis so simple thing so any time the etiological thing is involving the meningitis you will get the meningeal signs there are different methods for meningeal signs and uh, we, we all know that on clinical examination what are the causes so it would be a simple meningitis it would be meningoencephalitis or it would be uh, acute de uh, disseminated meningoencephalitis so if we see these are the these would uh, i would say these are the more of the localizing definition meningitis meningoencephalitis and now uh, these are overlapping syndromes you don't get a simple meningitis there might be a component of encephalitis you don't get a uh, you get uh, if it is a metabolic uh, cause is there you get more of encephalopathy than encephalitis so for me the it uh, the etiological things are overlapping so uh, what we need to see is uh it is more of the infective causes which will cause meningitis and meningoencephalitis so first we'll think of infective and then we'll keep non infective in the background so again uh, dr shiva prakash i think you've touched on this but if you could again say without meningeal signs we already discussed yeah. but I, there are some yeah i think it's already very clear the meningitis may be uh, sorry with encephalopathy encephalopathy may be with the meningeal sign or without the meningeal sign if you ask the what are the cause for without the meningeal sign or the clear disease most of the kids children and infants we cannot see the meningeal sign and whatever we see many a times acute febrile encephalopathy which are mostly a viral cause we may not see them this meningeal signs so maybe hsp maybe dengue whatever it is many whatever the virus you take that many non infective cause that is also they are not present like suppose a toxic encephalopathy vaccine encephalopathy maybe drug induced anticholinergic or maybe something systemic infections or maybe a organ failure like uremia all these things and rm like autoimmune conditions we may not see the most of the this non infective conditions you will not see the any meningeal sign and of course in the kids most commonly is the virus will not see the meningeal sign. So I think what we are just trying to tell you here is that if there is a patient with an encephalopathy with fever, you could have a wide variety of causes. So not only stick to infection, but you must always think of particularly now that we have a lot of vaccines being used. The most common causes of bacterial meningitis are being taken care of by immunization. So when you have a patient like this, your brain must also focus on if it could be something non-infectious. So many of these. as dr shiva prakash has and the others have highlighted many of these can have non infectious etiology so what about the immunocompromised individuals dr vasant is there any particular organism that we should think about or most, look for yeah most common um, immunocompromised child sir 
who are going to for splenic tomy those are diabetic or hiv so uh, they are um, commonest infections are what is the fungi they can go to tuberculosis and if you thinking of bacterial infection uh, step step pneumonia and listeria monocytic they are the commonest causes any any other causes you look like to know a lot whenever we are dealing with immunocompromised even us uh, even the bacterial infection they present into a very a uh, broader spectrum so uh, whenever we have uh, have a immunocompromised patient we think of brain abscesses a fungal fungal infection so here we have to why we need to know these organisms is the investigation wise and the treatment wise we need to be very aggressive so we can't be uh, uh, this thing even the rare like cryptosporidium these are uh, with, uh, which are not seen routinely we have to suspect them and whenever you get a csf sample we should ask for the special stains for them to yeah so i think he has hit the nail that when you have an immunocompromised patient your csf sample when you send it to the lab you must inform the pathologist that this is what you are suspecting because then only they will do the special stains and give you the organism otherwise everything will come negative so very well said both of you so uh, harsh any important points in the history that you want the post graduates and our audience to ask about in such cases so most of the time uh, to decide or to arrive at the conclusion of stainless infection is not that much difficult if you have fever headache one the cluster try the younger infant also sodium lactarginin or there is a seizures or any focal deficits uh, you may have but the more important points in the history along with that are also we need to look upon the possible etiologic factors so in the current if the child has a current febrile illness then child will remain stable for another 2 or 3 days and then again landed up with a flurry of seizures or posturing or something like that then definitely triggers in your mind that it could be parent facial port infection immune mediated phenomenon so we can look apart from the non infective causes along with the which is triggered by the infection that is also very important thing the second thing is that sometimes the uh, the child may have a diarrheal illness or oral ulcer which can point towards a certain viral etiology like enterovirus in certain geographical area as i am say that northeast or even the bihar and the surrounding the uh, up areas they have very more common uh, uh, etiology as a japanese encephalitis those can also help us to decide upon the possible etiologic factor and usually uh, in our textbooks also that mention uh, dr fanigel has beautifully mentioned there are two ways high ways and the low ways of coma so usually when the bacterial infection child present with the lethargy decreased activity decreased feeling which is a low way and usually the viral infection are present with a very agitated behavior uh, rowdiness we can say neuropsychiatric manifestation in the initial half then flurry of seizures and posturing which is a high way of coma so these are this could be the probable etiology and it also help us to even streamline our uh, possible investigation with the available resources and in acute settings to decide upon the how fast we can act in a best uh, way to offer the treatment any any other opinions history is very important even for the history and examination the examination part sometimes the patient may have a rash it may give the some clues Maybe a dengue, maybe a, uh, if you see the SR, maybe a rickets cell fever, or maybe sometimes the patient present with the macular papillary rash like a measles or mumps like a. Nowadays we are seeing lot of mumps cases also in Bangalore, so like uh, unilateral parotitis. So we can suspect something like that. Like organomegaly is there, we can typhoid also one of the organism even for the dengue also. Involvement of the liver is there, maybe a dengue, maybe leptospira. Like this, we are uh, history uh, will give the more information. Uh, for the diagnosis the history and examination is the paramount important uh, when evaluating for the investigating the thing so i think uh, what we are getting at here is that you have to take a background history the epidemiology is very important so if you have if you are in uh, up in west bengal in uh, northeast then are there many cases like this happening so which would indicate a japanese or a je like illness then rash which dr shiva prakash mentioned i think is very important because we know fever with rash with meningeal signs probably you are dealing with meningococcus or some other rickets chill illnesses then there are other non infectious causes or systemic diseases which can also present uh, with 
sometimes uh, CNS infection or CNS involvement. So like SLE, we have a rheumatologist sitting in the uh, audience and I think he'll really mind it if I don't say that if it's a female child, please also take the history of any past problems with the child had because sometimes, especially in the adolescent period, you can have a girl presenting with encephalopathy with fever and it could turn out to be a SLE. So these are very important points in the history. Uh, particularly the epidemiology, in many cases are occurring at the same time, then you can really reach a diagnosis just based on the history. So Dr. Nikhil, what about the emergence? You know, yeah. this is febrile fever with uh, altered sensorium is a medical emergency. So just can you outline the emergency management in these patients uh, briefly? Huh. So again, we have to go back to the basics of path. So first, when you receive a child, the first initial thing would be the maintenance of airway, breathing and the circulation. So airway, we have to see if the uh, child is maintaining the airway, if the GCS is very poor, the child may on admission require immediate intubation, ventilation. Uh, same thing for circulation. So any time you receive the child in emergency, you have to look for the blood pressure, uh, uh, look for the peripheral pulses, the CRT and start with uh, uh, fluid boluses and inotropes as and when required. The other thing would be important is the looking for the sugars. So whenever you get a child in emergencies, always look for an RBS because these babies are usually uh, septic and they may present with hypoglycemia, which may exaggerate their uh, ENS manifestation. So, so the more important would be the A, B, C, looking at hypoglycemia. From treatment point of view, you will start with the basic investigations. You will put an IV line, put a big large bore IV line, collect the samples and send the appropriate investigations at that time. As far as the drugs which are required is the first thing we need to see is wheat hypoglycemia. The second thing, if a child has presented with convulsion, the initial treatment with a benzodiazepine and loading up with the anticonvulsant, appropriate anticonvulsant. It may vary from center to center, but a appropriate anticonvulsant. The next thing would be starting an antibiotic uh, and antiviral and an anti-malarial. So while we are discussing more of the viruses, there are multiple areas where there is a cerebral malaria is more common and the child may present with fever. So initially in the emergency department, starting with the first dose of antibiotic, uh, uh, anti-malarial and acyclovir. The third thing would be uh, if there are signs of raised ICP uh, in the emergency, you can start with decongestive measures uh, uh, like a dose of mannitol or a 3% NN and we can wait. So if you see the more importance would be uh, to stabilize the patient, shift him to the ICU. And then uh, once the patient is stabilized, we can go for the further uh, management like the uh, neuroimaging and CNN. Excellent. I think he's taken up most of the points. So the issue to be highlighted here is that you stabilize the patient, maintain the ABC. Investigations can wait. The only investigation which is important when you first get the patient is to do a sugar and find out if the patient is hypo U or hyperglycemic. So thank you, Nikhil. And I think he has outlined uh, the management as per the Government of India guidelines where it is said that you have to give an antibiotic, the first dose. You give acyclovir because that's herpes encephalitis is the only treatable uh, viral encephalitis. And also in malarious areas, you would give an anti-malarial agent. So Dr. Shiva Prakash, now that we have stabilized this patient, what are the investigations that you would like to send? Uh, yeah, this patient is taken the history, examination is done, neurological examination is done, emergency treatment is given what to give. Now let us come to the investigations. Yeah, sir already mentioned actually, GRBC is very, very important because most of the times hypoglycemia, especially in the younger age group, may be present with encephalopathy. We should look into that. Second thing is basic investigation depends on your epidemiology, depends on your history, depends on your examination. Let us have a basic examination. After the basic examination, uh, basic investigation, we can go for the further. Suppose in the CBC, we can send for the CBC, we can get uh, RDT or peripheral smear for the malaria, RT for malaria. Sometimes rapid tests for the dengue we can send. 
other tests, even the wheel pillings, if you are suspecting for the rickets cell fever, or uh, other basic investigation we can have. Later on, we can go for the further uh, investigation. So, very important investigation in any encephalopathy is the LP, cerebrospinal fluid analysis. So, before that, prior to doing that LP, we are make sure that patient don't have any rise intracranial tension. That should be make sure that by doing the imaging or some uh, taking the precautions. So, we should do that. So, in that actually CSRP is the one actually gives the clue. Because once the uh, patient is developed encephalopathy means already that whatever the blood level investigation possibility may reduce actually. So, we have to take the more CSRP is a paramount important that can be said do for the even the routine investigation of the cell count uh, the uh, cell typing all these things can be some culture can be sent and also very important is nowadays is the pcr testing and the panel es panel is available so we can send for the es panel including the hsp dengue uh, even other organisms also included so depends on that we can do the pcr test so, so that we can get the specific uh, sometimes we can get the even the multiple multiple uh, investigation positive so most probably you have to compare with your clinic and you can take up to the what are the most common possibilities of course other investigations like a uh, ct mri can be considered for the depends on the condition of course eg should be considered the wherever it is available especially if the non convulsive status epilepticus or if you are not able to find uh, any other cause or specifically if your uh, EG helps in uh, diagnosing the patient with the HSV encephalitis because of the so, so what about what about the serum electrolytes? Would you give importance yeah, to yeah. that? So and also not only this basic investigation also told even the RFT and serum electrolytes. Serum electrolytes may be a, a hyponatremia, hyponatremia, other metabolites uh, abnormality also we have to look into that. Yeah. So important is you, you look at the serum electrolytes, particularly sodium because many of these patients may have conditions like SIADH or cerebral salt wasting or diabetes insipidus associated as a part of the disease and that's the only way you will be able to find out. So Dr. Vasant, since uh, Dr. Shiva Prakash has said that we will do an LP, so any contraindication, so we, we can do LP in all the patients. Look, uh, any serious infection, LP is a good sign, but there are two conditions where you have to delay LP and as soon as patient is stable. Suppose the patient is unstable, like uh, uh, patient is in a coma, patient is in a disabled residency, or you can take the question trial, that right? is the bradycardia, hypertension, and irregular respiration. And the uh, patient with Glasgow coma scale is below 8, then you have to avoid. So, raised ICP is one situation where you will avoid. And also another situation is suppose you have a thrombocytopenia. So you, you want to say something? Yeah. Disorder of mm -hmm. severe thrombocytopenia, a very low GCS and a raised, uh, raised intracranial pressure, which may cause herniation. Herniation. So, so these are the things that are to be remembered. So uh, Dr. Harsh, she has already said a few tests. So considering that now we have so much of availability with us of different kinds of uh, biofires and things like that what are the csf samples that you'd like to send for or maybe keep for future analysis so the procedure itself while doing csf the opening pressure itself can tell you uh, whether there is increased pressure or not and even the appearance of the csf certain hints in uh, certain situations and if you turn, come to the parameters of the csf testing the routine is very important so your sugar, protein and cells are very important thing, especially whenever, whenever possible, if you have a kid with suspected meningitis or CNS infection, and if the, there are no contraindication at present at the time of presentation, and the child is antibiotic naive or is not received any treatment, that's better to go for a CSF uh, first if feasible, because it's a very important to differentiate between the possible causes, possible etiologies on that uh, first sample. And whenever you have a relative less pleocytosis with high amount of hypoglycemic, that means low sugar, your sugar is just less than 15, less than 20, less than 10, and your cells are only 150 or one five or less than 500, and your patient has not received any antibiotics present to you, then it's a itself very suggestive of your routine in terms of tuberculin meningitis in our scenario. 
So these are the very important features of the basic CSF testing as well as CSF culture is also important. We have to also go for as Madam has discussed. Now the biofire and multiplex PCR are very easily available and although they are a bit costly but still now they are coming into the affordable range. So that help us to characterize to know the possible etiologies of the various common viruses, fungi and as well as the bacteria. So I think these are the very important things we can uh, look into the or we can gain from this area. And always keep an extra sample in the fridge because you know you might have to send it for something else. You cannot keep on repeatedly doing a lumbar puncture in this uh, in these kind of patients. So I think that is an important thing that you know you may have to send for some serological test or something else later on. So if uh, autoimmune encephalitis is suspected, only CSF anti MMDA is well, uh, required. Rest other tests are can be done from the serum. Nice. So, what are the indications of doing a neuroimaging now, Dr. Nikhil? No, Will we do it in all patients? So, as important as uh, CSF is there, a neuroimaging is also important. So, whenever a child is presenting uh, to you in an emergency in a critical stage, what is first important is to stabilize the child. Even for an LP, I would say that LP is not always required. We can start with the empirically a complete this thing and then we can do the LP and even the same for the neuroimaging first stabilize the child now uh, a neuroimaging is required in all the children so what we decide is uh, which would require it in an emergency so any child who has deteriorated rapidly any child who has focal sign or a focal seizures uh, what why is important is whenever there is a focality there is usually some uh, SOL or something which is affecting the brain on a unilateral side uh, so and there are signs of raised ICP so whenever you are seeing the child is having bradycardia hypertension there is a, a deep cerebrate or a decorticate posturing or any signs which are uh, pointing towards the raised intracranial pressure First, a neuroimaging should be done before doing a CSR. So, uh, uh, so as far as the question indications are, all children, all children with a CNS thing should get a neuroimaging. A neuroimaging, uh, if the child is very critical uh, and is not able to go through a complete MRI, then uh, now the MRI takes forty minutes. So, to get a complete neuroimaging for an unstable child. Uh, it uh, MRI is very difficult. So in these cases, a CT would be preferred. Now, CT has the advantages that it is rapid. So we'll, we'll, we'll discuss that later on. So uh, what is the message from here is that in a sick child, you probably would go for a CT because it hardly takes more than five minutes, right? So Dr. Shiva Prakash, now you tell me why, why CT or why MRI? Patient is stable, now I want to do a neuroimaging. Yeah. If you ask me or you, anyone, which one is best? But in this patient, especially purple encephalopathy, the best investigation is MRI because we will get the very clear information and also severity, extent, everything we can get that. But CT is the most commonly available, widely available in our point of whatever the care near to that. So in that actually CT, though it is a, there is a radiological, some hazard is there, but still widely we can use, especially in, a, in our resource limited setting. So where, before doing LP, because we have to rule out as we mentioned that intracranial tension, so we have to get the CT and also sometimes in a patient of immunocompromised or a patient with the severe the papilledema or a severe unconscious or abnormal unconscious the CT is a mandatory before doing the LP so that is very very important though CT is use uh, immediate investigation not taking much time and also by enhancing uh, the, by contrast by using the contrast the venetial enhancement will get abscess will get even sometimes any other uh, basal skull lesions all these things we can get from the in the, the CT is best even for the sometime we, when you send for the CT, usually the, the diffuse axonal injury, something like that. So if the traumatic is there, something uh, they will, will give the, will get that from the CT. Whereas in MRI, 
so it is a actually a, it takes lot of time it's a time consuming costly and also in a very difficult in a resource limited uh, uh, country like india to get the mri for all the patient to get and sometimes we cannot do the mri for the unstabilized patient and by doing the mri the patient can be unstable this also possible so in this actually mri though it is a good by the cause and the extent especially with encephalitis the clear encephalitis pictures can be get from the mri especially a diffusion weighted images will give the very clear picture especially hsv encephalitis sometimes um, uh, uh, what is that herpes uh, varicella uh, cerebellitis all this which are even for the uh, sometimes we can get the uh, enterovirus features specific to that so we can get very clear extent and also sometimes if you are having the dealing with the adm adm or necrotizing encephalopathy all these features very clearly we can get from mri only thing is mri is very costly very difficult to do and it time consuming sometime because of this sedation maybe complication of the sedation aspiration many things will occur very difficult very best investigation once the patient is stabilized or if you want to identify the what is the cause or something like that it is the best otherwise a, a, in an emergency ct is the one investigation is advocated in non emergent conditions you can last but the yes. thing is within 24 hours if you do the in any patient in encephalitis at least some things we can get the uh, information of course in a, in a further even a spectroscopy also can be done mri spectroscopy depends on condition and complications of sometimes uh, meningitis can be identified strokes uh, and other uh, thrombosis all this thing can be identified from that so the uh, message from this discussion is that in all cases probably ct is the one which you will do first and if you are suspecting that your patient is not responding to a usual way of treatment maybe an adm or things like that then you would probably go for an mri so very briefly doctor was uh, can you tell me what when to order for a contrast study uh, so the answer covered by dr rutle so if we are suspecting any infarct tuberculoma uh then you should go for a contrast study uh best best is the mri with contrast study as compared to a ct scan because there is a good meningeal enhancement you can see so, so I, either it's tbm or abscess, abscess then we will go for a yeah. contrast study okay i mean so i think we've already touched this uh, dr harsh uh did you want to say something with these images yeah if you so these are the images are showing the picture of tubercular meningitis so any patient when we think in terms of cns infection and the provided there are no contraindications to the contrast then contrast is desirable it will help us to delineate certain basal exudate and something you know early hydrocephalus and everything is visible in tubercular meningitis i do want to give only one message that for bacterial meningitis the contrast enhancement is not a surrogate marker of bacterial meningitis you know it depends on the acquisition of the images when it is taken the amount of contrast is given by the radiologist so there are many variables which counted for the contrast enhancement so bacterial meningitis is a clinical uh, we can think in terms of the clinical as well as csf finding the contrast is required or the bacterial meningitis the mri is useful to delineate the complication of that meningitis so subdural or sub ependymal abscesses or there is brain abscess or something like that that are the main indications for the uh, you know help us to uh, go for the imaging in this uh, bacterial meningitis and the complication as madam has mentioned the adm and the sometimes uh, this is a very uh, classical case of anti nmo positive patients he has a very uh classical uh, involvement of the cerebellar peduncle and the midbrain which are very particular area for nmoist patients and sometimes we see the anec acute necrotizing encephalopathy especially with dengue even corona and even the h influenza also we are seeing it is the subsequent these are the very peculiar finding in swan images when we can say the blooming which is a marker of hemorrhage thank you briefly can it yes, can uh, eg tell you the etiology uh yes so when there is a plates that is a pleomorphic uh, epileptic form changes is seen in eg we can suspect an hsv more important the eg will tell you the uh, cns status 
nowadays whenever you are getting a child with encephalopathy you should do an eg to look for a uh, whether there is a con diagnosing nowadays is fires that is a febrile infection uh, uh, febrile infections with resistant epileptiform seizures so these things when we are looking it is more important to get an eg even an autoimmune encephalitis presents with some characteristic eg pattern so eg though may not give you a large spectrum whenever it is used it will give you help you in the diagnosis of etiology and thank you so metabolic causes dr shiva prashad yeah. prakash so very very important mm -hmm. whenever the patient present the recurrent encephalitis if you are not able to find any cause especially in the early age group infant or something like that we should suspect the metabolic cause so we should the samples we have to take the sample before starting the treatment and before stopping the feed so we should take the sample and the third one is sample we have to take the from the blood for the ammonia lactate abg we can take and other tms we can send for the dry blood sample for the tms so depends on that we can do that so because delay in the taking the sample does not prevent the treating the patient treatment also should be started simultaneously what treatment will give will not give any other treatment specifically the non specific treatment of multivitamin and the cocktail treatment can be given to the patient so last question uh, to dr vasan before uh, we end yeah as per um, nikhil already covered everything it is immediately stabilization anti convulsant antibiotic and once the you your so what is the most yeah. common antibiotic that you one would usually uh, use most common antibiotic is citraxone citraxone and the antiviral as you said acyclovir and for malaria what would you uh, suggest artisunate artisunate so uh, i think we'll just thank you so much to the panelist i will just end with this uh, brief uh, algorithm i would say if you have any patient with fever and altered sensorium as we have already discussed first is abc followed by blood sugar manage the blood sugar as per the sugar levels and always send the lab value because your dextrose stick may not be reliable then you manage the fluids the icp and the seizures in the child then go for a detailed history and examination if there are focal signs and signs of raised icp always go for neuroimaging first if there are no focal signs you can do an lp with csf analysis and in the meantime also rule out dengue malaria and enteric fever and then go for the management where uh, i think this this is got stuck so we look at the electrolytes we look at the other investigations and manage as per we have discussed today that the antibiotics the antiviral and the anti malarials till we get our results thank you so much for a very active discussion i hope it was beneficial to all